Okay. Uh, I think we can start now. People can join in as and when uh, they do so, and I'll admit them. Okay. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you here, and welcome everyone to our webinar on Right to a Healthy Environment on the Occasion of Human Rights Day 2020. I am Maxim, your host and moderator for today, and it is my privilege to welcome our three panelists, Ridima, Seher, and Joni. Welcome, and thank you for being with us here today. Well, uh, we are here on this important day, uh, Human Rights Day 2020, first adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 1948. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a milestone document. Uh, it proclaims the inalienable, inalienable rights which everyone is entitled to as a human being, irrespective of race, color, religion, sex, language, political or other opinion, or social origin, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. The theme of Human Rights Day 2020 is recover better, stand up for human rights. This theme is especially important as it focuses on the times that we are currently living in. A pandemic that has exposed the fault lines in our societal order, along with the entrenched systematic and intergenerational inequalities, exclusion and discrimination. Through its zoonotic origins, COVID-19 virus has shown us the dangers of underestimating nature and its fine, delicate balance, which we as humans, despite all our advancements, have yet to fully appreciate or understand. Thus, environmental protection and a healthy environment is imperative if we are to survive and progress as a civilization. Diverse ecosystems, clean water, air, soil are indispensable for human health, well-being and security. In today's discussion on a right to healthy environment, we are going to talk about what it means to have this right, why is it important, and what we can do about it, especially in the context of how it affects young children and youth and their future. But before we begin, a quick introduction of our esteemed panelists. Our first panelist is Radhima Pandey, a young climate activist from India. A fierce advocate of children's environmental rights, she joined Greta Thunberg on September 20th, 2019 at the Global Climate Strike in New York. She has also filed a complaint against five countries, along with 15 other teenagers in the United Nations for not doing enough to stop climate change. Next, we have Seher Rashid Beg. Seher is a young advocate for climate, ocean, gender, and human rights, and a global SDG facilitator. She's the contact point of the Human Rights Working Group of Yango, the UNFCCC constituency for children and youth. Seher has been speaking in the panel of different human rights activists and high-level speakers, such as David Boyd, UN Special Rapporteur for Environment and Human Rights, Catalina Devin Das, Costa Rican Ambassador to the UN, and Michelle Bachelet, UN High Commissioner to Human Rights. Our final panelist is Joni Pegram, the founder and director of Project Riot, an organization dedicated to mainstreaming children's rights in environmental decision-making and action. Joni is an independent expert on the interface between child rights, climate change, and environmental issues and consults with UNICEF and other actors. Welcome once again, guys. A few housekeeping rules before we begin. Uh, I would request uh, everyone to keep their uh, microphones on mute. Uh, we will have a question and answer session towards the end of our discussion with the panelists. Hence, I request everyone to hold on to their questions until then. We would also request you to keep your questions short and to the point in the interest of time as well as to give others a chance. Finally, you can either send us your questions via the chat feature in Zoom or unmute yourselves and ask us your questions live. Thank you. So let's begin. So when we talk about human rights, it is usually in the context of civil and political rights, the economic, social, and cultural rights. What about the human right to a healthy environment? Uh, how did this come about? in the discourse on human rights. And my this question is to uh, uh, all of the panelists and guys feel free to uh, take any, any of, anyone of you is free to take it up.
we'll all be very polite I think in, in waiting I can I can skip in first um, I'd love to hear from the others um I think it, you know so historically this dates back so the the um, human right to a healthy environment first emerged um through the Stockholm Declaration in 1972, Stockholm Declaration on, on the Human Environment. That was where it was first articulated. And then um, the countries of Portugal and Spain actually integrated that into their national constitutions in the 1970s. But since then, we've seen a huge spread um, across uh, almost now 80% of UN member states now recognize the, the human right to a healthy environment at the national uh, level or through regional treaties. Um, but I think in terms of your, your question around, you know, whether this reflects political civil rights or economic, cultural, social rights, et cetera, it's, it's really both. I mean, it's all encompassing. We know that, the, you know, the environmental harm has such wide sweeping impacts on, on many rights that are protected under the UN Declaration on Human Rights. So it encompasses the rights to things like, you know, clean air safe water, a safe climate, safe and sustainably produced food, um, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, but it also encompasses those civil and political rights such as um, you know, the right to have access to environmental information and the right to participate in decision making um, and the right to have access to justice as well. So it, it really is sort of cross-cutting which reflects the fact that you know, the environment is absolutely integral to our, our well-being as humans and, and our our ability to live lives of dignity as well. Thank you, Jordan. Seher, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I was about to say, thank you so much, Johnny. And thank you so much, Maxine, for summarizing the question so well. And thank you so much, Johnny, so to highlight how much we need the right to a healthy environment as a legal system in our legal system. So I would like to highlight one thing here. When we say human rights, I think that the majority of people uh, think about all the contexts that uh, Maxon mentioned in the first part of the question, the legal right, the political right, the social and uh, religious right to a healthy environment, to, to human rights, right? This is what we think about. But um, the way we or the way as a climate activist or as, as somebody who stands for both human rights and climate and ocean and gender and everything I, I see it that climate crisis is the biggest culprit behind a lot of the human rights issues and then climate crisis is just one part of the environmental crisis we face in environmental crisis and about so many things so environmental crisis is just not about the climate it's about everything else it's about why a lot of the children die uh, just when they're one day old because of malnutrition why a lot of the women a lot of the a lot of the women and old people are affected by severe weather events and they are the most affected why the vulnerable and marginalized communities don't have uh, access to safe water safe sanitation situation or clean water for example so I believe that by securing their right or by knowing more about their right to a healthy environment, people just won't secure, um, you know, good weather. They won't just secure good weather, but they will actually secure a healthy and safe right. I believe that climate justice is the only way forward if we want to have a safe future for the youth and for the children. So this is how... Uh, I mean, I mean, this is how human rights is interrelated to uh, the right to a healthy environment, because it's just not about the environment. The environment is influencing our lives in every single way. So, yeah, just believe if the whole ecosystem just disappeared one day, what will you have? You won't have democracy. You won't have any other right to any other thing. This is very. This is a very fundamental right. It's the fundamental right of every single religious or eth ethnic minorities and majorities to have a right to a healthy environment. This is what I believe, especially to our children, because they are the ones who are being disproportionately affected by climate crisis or environmental crisis, and they are not the ones who are creating any mess. So I, this is why it's important, and this is how it's related to human rights. Thank you, Seher, for pointing that out, that it's uh, it's disproportionately affecting a certain section of our population. And uh, sadly, it's affecting children and young people the most. Uh, it's affecting their future. Uh, taking 
taking ahead from this, uh, Rudima, would you have something to add about this in a sense? What does the right to healthy environment mean to you from your perspective? So it's like I totally agree with what uh, like Johnny and Seher said because it's like, uh, you know, it's like everyone just think about like when it comes to human rights, it's just about like the socioeconomic rights. But not uh, like, but not most of the people do come to like the environmental right, uh, like a right to have clean air, clean water, and healthy environment. And to be honest, it's like, uh, it's like most of the people have somewhere got it when they were kids. But to be honest, right now the children of this generation, presently the kids are not even having this right. And it's like it's it's a human right. But at the same time, it's like for children, it's the most necessity. It's 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 hard necessity to have clean air to have clean water and to have healthy surroundings to grow up properly to have a good health uh, so that we could concentrate on our study because if we doesn't because it's like every time we do study if you're not like uh, eating properly or healthy you can't concentrate on studies if you're well not well you can't concentrate on your studies so if you don't have a healthy environment or if we are if we are suffering from a problem which is kind of like caused by us then somewhere we can't really concentrate on the work which we are doing. So to be honest, it's like a uh, healthy environment is one. For me, it's like healthy environment is one of the most important human right. And it's like, uh, especially for the kids to grow properly, to nurture properly. And it's like in context, as Seher said, we are not the one destroying the things, but still bearing the consequences of what's been happening. So uh, it, it's like for me, totally, it's like uh, having a, healthy environment should be our topmost priority rather than just uh, having like rather than just uh, uh, fighting out in political issues on religious issues or just being like considering that development is one of the most important thing and just like sacrificing your right in front of that and not knowing that okay it's like clean air is my right no one really says that right because when it comes to like Delhi air pollution like it's like I won't say most of the people in India know about it because I know it's like everyone out in the world knows about like the air pollution problem in Delhi. And to be honest, when the debates come out, no one really says that it's my right to have a clean air. Everyone is like, okay, air pollution has been increasing. But no one is like, okay, air pollution is happening, but clean air is my right and I have to fight for that. So the like for me, it's it's most important, but at the same time, it's like no one really cares about it. No one really raises their voices against that, that my right is getting uh, somewhere destroyed or it's like I'm not getting a proper air or anything. So it's just like it's it's a way of like what people think towards it. But yeah, for me, it's it's like it's, it's our necessity. Right. Uh, thank you, Radhima, uh, especially for pointing that out, uh, that it's not only pollution, it's about a right to, uh, to clean air, to clean uh, air, which uh, we don't realize is, uh, it should be a fundamental right, should be something that we shouldn't have to think about. And even uh, when it comes to water, uh, and uh, my, my next question would be to Joni in this, uh, Joni, what do you have to say here, uh, especially from what Radhima just uh, told us, uh, a young person, a 13-year-old, uh, telling us, and how do you think, uh, what what role would adults have to play? And uh, you have also worked closely on the Intergovernmental Declaration on Children, Youth and Climate Action at COP25 in Madrid. Could you tell us more about that? Uh, why did UNICEF and uh, the Children's Environmental Rights Initiative, the organization, that the network that you are associated with, decide to co-create this declaration with the young people? Uh, so I'm sorry, my question is into two parts. One is what you have to say about uh, how as adults, uh, uh, what, what, what kind of uh, messaging slightly older adults can give to our young children uh, when they have to take up the mantle of fighting for their uh, rights and their future. And the second question is on the, the declaration that uh, was signed in uh, COP25 in Paris. Yeah, thanks, Max. And well, I think, I mean, the first thing to say is obviously that the adults currently are utterly failing the younger generations. I mean, there's just no doubt about that in terms of the trajectory we're on. Um, and I think, you know, the points were very powerfully made by both Redeemer and Sahar about the crisis that this represents for, for children. Um, you know, there, there's terrifying numbers. One in four children under the age of four, uh, under the age of five rather, are dying 
every year that's 1.7 million children dying due to avoidable environmental impacts that is that is disgraceful that's outrageous um you know children are disproportionately vulnerable to all of these impacts and as, as um Redima said they've had very little role zero role in creating those those problems and i think you know as adults we have an obligation a moral obligation to children but more than that a legal obligation on, under international law um, every country in the world bar one bar the us has ratified the un convention on the rights of the child uh, which commits states to uphold children's rights and of course environmental degradation the climate crisis are undermining virtually all of those rights so i would say adults are, are failing and it's you know clearly what we see now with the sort of incredible work of, of child activists like and youth activists, you know, Redima, the climate litigation, Sahar through her international advocacy work is incredible. Um, and, and young people are so passionate about this issue, quite rightly and quite understandably. Um, and we have an obligation, both again, legal and moral, to listen, to give space to, to, to child and youth activists at the table and to act on their demands. And that is a right that is enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So we need to be upholding that, that right and using every single lever we have at our disposal, policies, um, you know, legal frameworks to make sure that, that their rights are being upheld and respected and protected. And I think that one of the most powerful tools we have at our disposal is to try and push for the adoption of the right to a healthy environment, which would be a catalyst. It wouldn't be necessarily, uh, you know, it wouldn't solve our problems overnight, but it would be a huge catalyst for progress in this area. So as, as sort of a part of the network of the Children's Environmental Rights Initiative and UNICEF, this is a priority to, to advocate towards governments to adopt this at the international level. And that then links to your second question, which is the intergovernmental declaration um, on children, youth and climate action that was launched last year at COP25. Um, just to give a bit of background on that, it's the first, uh, I would say it's groundbreaking in the sense that it's the first commitment by states um, to children and young people in, in this sort of international context of climate talks which is ridiculous when you think about it, that that's the first time that that's happened. Uh, we have 12 government signatories on board so far. The declaration was drafted based on uh, young go priorities and inputs. Um, so that, that's the official youth constituency to, to the UNFCCC where, where the climate negotiations take place. Um, but also based on the inputs of children from around the world that we, we collect messages through the Children's Environmental Rights Initiative activities and particularly through our online poll which I'll share a link to in the chat so that if, if anyone's listening and, and wants to provide their own inputs and messages to world leaders that they can do so. Um, and the declaration sets out seven key commitments by governments across, you know, um, protecting their rights through climate policies, ma making sure that children's perspectives and rights are mainstreamed through their, their climate action, um, including their participation and their right to be heard, their right to have education on climate change, which we know children feel very passionately about and it's extremely important to equip them for the future and to make them more resilient. Um, so I'd really encourage um, people to check out the declaration um, and the, the Younger recently launched an open letter to call on governments to sign up as well, which I think is exciting. And, and I think we'll be doing a lot more work on the declaration next year in the run up to COP26. So that's quite exciting. Um, yeah. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, so 12 governments have signed on to this declaration, uh, 12 countries, am I right? And uh, out of how many secretaries in the UNFCCC, how many do we have in you, to UN 190? I so, think it's 193. And yes, yeah, so, so far, we, we'll be working on it. We need far, far more. Yes, yes. I mean, I just wanted to point out that uh, work has just begun and uh, it's, it's, high, it's uh, high time that we, and I'm glad that Yango has started this, uh, this campaign, this open letter to urge governments. In fact, my next question to you was that how do we get not just 12, but all 193 countries? After all, it's about uh, children. It's about our young people. And this is not something that we wait and deliberate upon. So uh, yeah, uh, my, my next uh, question uh, to follow up with what Jody said is to Seher. Uh, Seher, you work, you work with Yango, uh, the youth and NGO constituency of the uh, UNFCCC. Uh, why did Yango find it important to create such a declaration uh, in the first place? Could you tell us more about your work and about uh, Yango's inputs in this declaration? 
Sure. Uh, thanks, Maxine. And thanks, Johnny, for highlighting the open letter. And every single person who's present in this call are much welcome to uh, take that open letter and push their governments to sign the uh, the COP25 Intergovernmental Declaration because it's super important not only for the for the youth of today but also for the future generation and children that uh, we have right now. So uh, as far as my the question you asked to me, Maxine, is concerned, uh, why Yengo took this forward and why Yengo got involved into this? Uh, the major reason is that Yengo, uh, just as John said, Yengo is the official constituency of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. But uh, for youth and children, uh, but we really want to highlight here that Yengo is an all-inclusive platform. So it's not that it's just for uh, people who are privileged enough to know, uh, to, to have a knowledge already about climate change, but it's also for people, for young people and children who want to get engaged more in, and get, want to know more about climate change. So um, why, I mean, Yengo is a platform for all vulnerable and marginalized youth and children. Yengo is a platform for children of all color, all sexes, all religion, all ethnicities. Yango is a platform for everyone. Why we took this declaration forward is because we believe that every single person, every single child has a right to a healthy environment and it is actually just this simple. But we believe that, just as I said in my last statement, children and young people are being disproportionately impacted, but also children and young people who belong to the vulnerable and marginalized communities. Um, as a person who has been working in this field, I have not seen a lot of uh, children and young people who belong to the vulnerable and marginalized communities to uh, that they came ahead for example, children and young people from the global south uh, that they came ahead and talk to talk about their rights and were so empowered that they could talk about their rights and they were so empowered that they knew their rights, right? So Yengo is actually, you can say the action element or Yengo wants to give the action element to the youth of today and the future generations of tomorrow that they recognize their rights and they can take a stand for their rights. So a lot of us love to have like, uh, love to youth wash ourselves. A lot of the organizations love to youth wash, youth wash us. And like even our own governments love to youth wash us. But in Yengo, you will actually know what your right is and how to stand for your right. And they, there is no harm in speaking up because it's actually your fundamental right. So this is about Yengo and why Yengo went ahead with the declaration because Yengo firmly believes uh, uh, about, about the fact that the that every single person has a right to a healthy environment, but children and young people are especially affected by uh, the climate change, and they especially have um, uh, a right to have a healthy environment. Did that answer your question, Maxin? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's great. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ritipa, do you have something to add to this? I... Uh, if it's a thing, I won't really add because it's like the almost covered everything. It's like Seher explained it really, really very well. Johnny explained it really, really very well. So I would just say it's like, it, it was great explanation. It's like for me, even it's it's like, it was so easy to understand that like a small child could even understand that. So I won't add anything. It, it was just amazing. All right. Well then, uh, Ritima, could you uh, tell us more about uh, the petition that uh, you signed along with uh, Greta Thunberg at the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. And uh, why this petition? Why did you decide to sign this? Uh, so it's basically like the convention that we had. It's like it's in total like uh, we or uh, like in total we seen signs uh, like uh, did this petition. So it was about uh, like protecting the child rights as like as we're talking about the rights. Uh, it was about child rights, so that was against five countries. Those who signed the Child Rights Convention. So it's basically that those countries, somewhere their emissions kind of like because it's like when you do it, it's it's like it's gonna pollute the air, and uh, somewhere like uh, the greenhouse gases are gonna come out. Global warming is gonna get increased up, more natural disasters and stuff like that. So it's somewhere is going to affect our rights because we are not getting a healthy. 
a healthy environment somewhere because the air is polluted the water is polluted out there most of the like uh, companies or like industries out there are not really following up all the measures and uh, it's like our uh, polluting our airs are releasing their chemicals straight forward into the water and uh, the our surroundings are like really really not really clean because it's like there's little all a uh, litter all over here and it's somewhere it's like what i feel is like a uh, somewhere government plays a bigger part in this as compared to us common citizens because they have the power in their hand to regulate the things out if someone is not following up the rules properly say it's like uh if it's the companies i can't go out there to them you can't go straight forwardly to them write a letter anything to them and would be like okay you can't run your company because you're polluting the air because you are putting up your uh, chemical waste straight into the rivers they won't listen to me but they would listen to the government because they have the power in their hand they can make the laws they can uh, like kind of like change the laws according to them and it's their duty somewhere to make them get followed up on ground as well and to act uh, take action against them those who are not following it properly so somewhere we felt that uh, the countries the governments are failing to give us our uh, the proper rights that we should get the proper like uh, sort of environment that should uh, that every children should get without getting discriminated on any basis uh that's that is somewhere missing and that's why we did that uh we signed that convention and to be honest in 2017 i filed the uh petition against the government of india at the national green tribunal uh, due to their failure on tackling climate change but at the same time because they were not really taking enough action to mitigate climate change and they were just doing the work on paper not on ground and somewhere my petition got dismissed by the national green tribunal and it was kind of like really disheartening moment so when i heard about uh, when i got a chance of like signing the convention and having a bigger group and taking the issue which is slightly similar to what i am working on it's like child rights and prot- protecting the future i somewhere felt like doing it in a bigger level with uh, like a bigger kind of like group of kids can really bring up a change and to be honest i really had many hopes uh, from the united nations so i was just like i just want to do it uh, so that's why i signed the convention so it was pretty much like because i was working in the same field and as i was kind of like was little down because of my petition got getting dismissed i somewhere it boosted me up that okay signing this can really bring up a change it's like uh, suddenly if i do have to work at something i just feel like okay if i do this it, it it's going to bring a change it's like i doesn't even consider that whether it's going to get accepted by the united nations or not i was just like it can really bring up a change and i really have to be a part of it because i somewhere really feel that yes it should be done in a bigger level and like more countries uh, should be holded accountable so that's why i signed the convention and yeah that was pretty much it about like why i signed it and what it is about thank you radhima and let me uh, take this opportunity to say that uh, what an incredible uh, uh, decision that you have made to do this it's courageous it's uh, uh, it's uh, i just want to thank you for showing the way to other uh, setting an example rather to uh, uh, children your age and uh, others adults like us uh, if you could do it if you can raise an important your voice against such an important issue then uh, uh, it's 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 everyone's duty to to uh, do this and uh, i just have a, another uh, uh, question here and uh, anyone can feel free to answer this as and thank you very much for throwing some some of the uh, some light on these questions these issues uh, i have a question now what can what can one do at at personal level what can i do when i started uh talking uh, thinking about this uh topic for this webinar when i did my research uh well uh through my work uh i organized this webinar but on a personal level or on a local level or at a national or regional levels uh can what can we do what can a person do how can we band together uh how can we get on to the work that you are doing rudima or uh, joni how can we uh get together with c a uh, seri or with uh, sahar your work with the yanko uh, how is it that a, a common ordinary citizen uh can uh can take action on this on this uh, spread the message about this so yeah that's that's 
uh, that's what I'm wondering. How what can we do about it? I go ahead. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so it's like for me, what I think is that if uh someone wants to take an action, it should be the willingness to do, like to bring a change. And uh, there should be a determination that yes, I have to bring a change, and at the same time, it has to be like you have to be really patient, uh, because it's like uh when uh like for me even it's like it was a long period learning because in uh like in twenty thirteen I came to know about a global warming until twenty thirteen till twenty seventeen I learned about the thing and then I took action. So uh, and it's like uh, when it comes to my friends. i told them about climate change and they were like okay then very next day they were like okay i want to do a petition and i was like you don't even know like anything about it and you want to do a petition what are you going to do about it? they were like okay tell me what should i do i'll just do that it's like so it can't really happen and to be honest it's like for me even when i started living a sustainable life because that was my very first action so when i tried to live a sustainable life uh, for me it was just like reducing out my emissions trying my best educating myself and uh, my friends my family my locality so that was, that was what i was doing i was re- reducing out my emissions i used to like walk a lot i used to i skipped out uh, it's like one of my favorite things which had like single use plastic i try to like carry on a uh, sort of like a uh, kind of my own carry bags so having all those things uh, somewhere it's like i just thought like when i would do all these things it's going to bring a change so after like month or so i was like i can't really see any change so it's useless but to be honest when i came to know the reality it's just like uh, things can't really change up just by me uh, trying to do it it like or it can't just like change in a small span of time so it's like would i uh, feel it's like it has to be like we have to be slow and study and we okay i think uh, uh, we lost radhima due to the internet we should probably wait for her to get back uh, but yes uh, Jody and Sahar, what what are your thoughts on this? What what Ritima said and uh, what what my question? Yeah, sure. I can go ahead if Johnny doesn't have anything to do with that. So yeah, uh, no, I totally agree with Ritima, and I see her as as an inspiration not only for the children of today but also for a lot of the adults and the young people as well. So change always starts from from within, right? so change does not comes from the outside uh, even if your outside is melting and you're blind to see it it's totally fine you need to realize you need to say it it like to yourself like okay i need to change but yeah so the first step is that if i talk about uh, if i talk about it in a very subcontinental context maxim um even you know that the subcontinental uh, countries have a lot of regional languages right and then uh, the education is mostly available in english here and the major problem i see it's it's totally good we need to give the international context to our children it's totally fine i don't have any major objections about that what i have an objection on is that we don't have climate education available in different regional languages because uh, the people of vulnerable marginalized communities in our country in the subcontinental countries they do not speak english they do not speak the national languages they cannot even read and write in their own language they can understand their own language but they cannot read and write so the thing is that how can we actually uh, start uh, this this change is at a local level we need to if you speak some regional language then please go ahead and uh, be climate literate first and then make other people climate literate people of your people who speak your same uh, the same regional languages as you make them uh, tell them about climate change tell, aware them about environmental education aware them how this can improve their work right if they if they become climate literate how this will improve their work and this is something that i can say uh, one can do at a local local context so uh, uh, me as a person or what we do uh, in our house is that uh, we we do small things like we try to avoid waste uh, whenever i have money 
I think a lot before I spend it. I try to ne never consume. I don't buy a lot of clothes. I try to spend in a circular way. I always think where my money money is going, what I'm spending on, and how it's going to stay in the loop with the nature. The other thing is that, uh, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's kind of funny maybe, but I don't know, it's super important that we realize how we're wasting the energy because I think that con conserving the energy is, is I think our major way out at the moment, this, this is how I see it. So at our home, we, we run off the electrical appliances for four hours, even if it's the refrigerator or air conditioner or whatever it is, the lights and the bulbs. But we, we turn it off for four hours. It's just our small step to give back to the community, for example. When it comes to the local, uh, when it comes to the international um, perspective like what can you do in this for the international community uh well first of all you're all most welcome to join Yengo. we have different working groups and uh we all are trying our best to work, bring the change and uh we all have always place for the global youth and we always have place for no matter where you come from we always have a place for you so yeah i can send the membership for the link of the membership form in the chat and you're all are welcome to sign it, sign in for that, and yeah, be a part of Shingo. But uh, how I see it is uh, that I now want to come back to Rhythma's point because she's also back. So I I want to highlight her uh, how or like what how important is the role of our children and how important is the role of our young people in this and how important it is for our adults to believe on them because they're standing for their future. They they're standing for uh, they're speaking their mind and they're spent, uh, standing against the climate crisis. And this is so important. This is what we should all be doing. When you're at the dining table, talk to your children about how the climate was is affecting them. When, uh, well, if you have somebody who works at your home and does not have access to um, general education, let alone climate education, right? Talk to them, try to make them aware. If you meet a fisherman, try to tell them how doing some uh, control on their emission can solve their fishing problems or whatever. I believe that climate change is, a. I also said it before, it's the culprit behind every single human right. So if you want to, if you want to save yourself, uh, if you don't care about anybody else, but if you want to save your own self, then you have to make other people aware of climate change. This is how it works. It won't, it, nothing will change overnight. And nothing will, nothing will just change when you, you know, just stop doing it. You cannot give up on this. It's your mother nature. You have to be compassionate. You have to be kind towards it, right? So this is what I believe that we, we should be doing in the regional and international and personal perspective. Uh, elegant context, yeah. I think you're on mute, Maxon. Sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Sir, thank you for those uh, fine points and uh, welcome back, Radima. If you would like to uh, continue with what you were saying before you got cut off, uh, feel free to do so. Yeah, thank you. I'm really sorry. Uh, I would just say, as Shahar said, things are not going to change overnight. And that, that's the case because it's like, to be honest, when I started, uh, it's like, as I said, the very first step I took was uh, like living a sustainable life. So it's like, it was that I started living a sustainable life. I reduced out my emissions. I started uh, like uh, taking my own carry bags and stuff. I stopped using single-use plastic, I really stopped out junk food and stuff. And I was like, things are going to change now. And after a week or sort of like month or so, I was like, okay, things are going to change. So in my mind, I was like, okay, no floods would happen now. Nothing is going to happen. Everything is going to settle up because I'm trying to live a sustainable life. But after a time, I heard about the news that, okay, this flood, happened, this flood hit this area. And these many people died. And I was like, I was really confused at that time because I was like, I am living a sustainable life and why things are not changing up. And I just like, because I read it, it in an article that uh, if you try to live a sustainable life, it could really bring up a change. So I just went to my mom because she was the one like uh, making me understand the things and helping me out. So I was like, mom, this is what happened. I tried to live a sustainable life and but things are not really changing. So am I doing something wrong or is the article wrong? 
I was really confused out there. Uh, so that was the time when I came to know about only just me trying to do my best can't really change up the things. So it has to be collective, uh, kind of like action from everyone. And at the same time, it's really gonna take a time. And the that action that I took was a really like time consuming thing. So that was the thing. So it's really important for us to understand that things are not gonna change overnight as well. And at the same time, it's like somewhere us trying to. Like step out from our comfort zone can really bring up a change because it's like if you try just to like limit out your emissions, like it, it's it's gonna be really challenging for you in the very beginning. Even if it's just like switching off the lights, because as kids, uh, like we do have a habit of like, okay, I was sitting in this room, I had all my lights on, my fans on, and then I just moved out to different room and didn't switch off the lights and fan. It's and it's still going. So it's like. For us, it's like okay, it's just electricity. It's not emitting, but yes, it is. It's like uh, converting the things up, uh, making out electricity it itself is a really big, big process. So it's like knowing out what we are consuming, it's like how it is emitting, and it's like how much it is going to affect our environment is also a really big thing. But the most important thing is just like uh, being aware of what's been happening yourself and trying to make. Uh, like uh, all your community is aware because you uh, alone can't bring up a change. So yeah, that's it. What I would like to say. Thank you, thank you, Radhima. Uh, Joni. Yeah, I, I mean, I of course I I couldn't agree more with everything that Radhima and Sahar have said. I I think the first point that was made, um, you know, is absolutely right, get informed. That's got to be the first step to to having, to feeling more equipped and empowered to to tackle these issues and to know, um, you know, what the issues are and therefore how you might start to bring about change. Um, and I, actually, I'm, I'm gonna share a, a child-friendly version of a, a UN report on children's rights and the environment, which sets out many of these issues in a clear way. I was, it's, Called a child-friendly version, but actually, I think most adults prefer to read it as well. It's much, uh, much easier reading than most UN reports. I think on the question of of sort of what you can do at an individual level, obviously the changes that Sahar and Redima have talked about are important, and and certainly talking with other community members, making people aware. But I'm always very conscious of the fact that when we focus only on on so or so much on what we as individuals can do we actually detract attention from what is you know the, the actors that have a huge responsibility for the for the for the crisis we're in and that's you know the governments that have contributed most to this problem the wealthy individuals who take up a vast share of you know in terms of fair share of resources um, and 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 companies who are not doing their part um, and I think, you know, the vast majority, billions of people around the world contribute very, very little to the problem and to the crisis we're in. And so I think, yes, of course, as, at an individual level, we have to do what we can, but let's ensure that we're also um, informing ourselves and, and not only on what the problem is, but how we can advocate to change the system that is the problem and to make sure that those actors are held to account. Um, and that means looking at the levers we have dis at our disposal, whether that's legal or policy routes. And so, um, I mean, also in, in terms of the, the question of, you know, it won't change overnight, that, that's true. It's a huge issue. It's, it's enormously complex. But look what we've managed to do with COVID-19. Look how quickly governments have spent millions, billions on recovery and what they're doing. Look at their recovery plans. Look at what they've done to their economies. I mean, when anyone says to you, oh, we can't solve this, it's just too difficult, it's simply not true. And we've seen that now. And we know that, you know, these governments are accountable to us. So um, human rights movements historically have brought about huge change. They've always faced uh, opposition and people saying, oh, you'll never do it, it's too difficult, you know, whether it was women's rights or the rights of people of colour in the US, you know, it's civil rights movements. It's just, we realise now that this is simply not true. And so we have to act um, accordingly and in terms of what people can do I mean so obviously um, you know I work on sort of the international advocacy space um, and people can join the children's environmental rights initiative action network um, which is a sort of a group of global advocates who are pushing for children's right to a healthy environment and we have an exciting campaign we'll be launching next year around this um, and so if you sign up to that and I'll post the link 
um, you can stay informed on how you can collaborate and become a, a partner organization in SERI or simply take actions as and when. Um, so that's sort of one, one clear route. And yes, yeah, staying informed about various campaigns to push governments to, to, change, to change the system. Well, thank you, Joni. Uh, thank you uh, to Seher and Ritima as well for the I just, wonderful discussion. Okay, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, ahead. Max. I just had one ahead, important thing to highlight. Sure, so sure, please. I just want to do justice to my to my chance of being a speaker here and want to address everybody who is in this panel right now at this moment. And um, I just want to talk to all the young people in this very moment. And I want to tell you all how proud I am that when the governments and the politicians, the world leaders surrendered to the pandemic and they stopped work working for the climate crisis, they stopped having dialogues, uh, the climate dialogues or major climate, ha climate happenings were all postponed. You people took the momentum forward. You people did not let the momentum to die. And you people actually took the action for the climate. And this is how change will come. And this is how we will change the world. And I, as an individual, as a young person, believe on you all. And so you, you, should all, you should all be believing on yourself. We all have to push our governments to not only build back better after this pandemic, but build back greener after, during this pandemic as well. Because we will be facing major plastic crisis after this pandemic. We are already facing major plastic crisis. Um, but I believe that... Uh, especially during this uh, this COVID, uh, yeah, this COVID year, 2020 was a year of lessons, and we should not forget it. Uh, how uh, I want to highlight some major key happen events that was solely organized by the young people. One of them was mock up, of course, and uh, the other one was. And the other one is happening and it's a virtual conference of youth and it's solely organized by the youth and you are all the encouraged parties are welcome to collaborate with Yango if they want and uh, we also organize side events with in collaboration with Siri and UNICEF uh, to address the declaration uh, as well so the young people and the momentum uh, about climate change they're not letting that letting it die so you should all just keep working towards it and we will build back better soon in a more greener way. Thanks. This is all I wanted to say. You're muted again, oh. Maxine. <laughs> I keep forgetting to unmute myself. Thank you, Sahir, for uh, that very inspiring and positive message. Uh, we can now move into our uh, Q&A round. Uh, so uh, I welcome the participants to uh, to either send in your questions via chat or to unmute yourself and ask uh, your questions to our panelists. Uh, before that, we have one question uh, from uh, Bijit, who says that uh, the floods in Kerala a couple of years ago were a result of poor natural and biodiversity management. The larger question here is, why do governments not learn from bitter experiences? So, uh, or we could say, why do politicians not learn from bitter experiences or from past experiences? Anyone wants to take this up? Okay, I just go ahead and jump in because I think that it's so much of a question to all of us, to be honest, to the to the person who has this question. To be very honest, it's so much of a question to us as well because uh, we are super confused because if they wanted to take action, they could have. They just seriously do not. First, they don't learn from their uh, miss past mistakes, but that's the very old case. The major element here is that they don't take climate crisis as their existential crisis, as our existential crisis for that matter, because it is a threat to our existence, our future generation and our children. And they, you can see that they seriously don't uh, care about that. And this is why just as Johnny Ridema and I all and Maxine, thank you so much for uh, inviting us here. This is why we're here. And this is why we're pushing the governments to sign the COP25 Intergovernmental Declaration. And this is why you should also uh, push your government to sign the COP25 Intergovernmental Declaration. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a question from Fernanda who says, which should be the best way to involve young people? 
that do not understand that climate crisis is a serious issue. Anyone wants to take it up? Maybe Ridhima, because it's it's talking about young people, and maybe I could throw in a question here and stop being a moderator and be a more of a participant. Uh, I'm wondering how how is it uh, for you, Ridhima, as a young person, as uh, as a young climate activist? What is your what what kind of uh, uh, issues do you face? What hurdles do you face? I think probably and uh, maybe from the Indian culture or from uh, including for me also as a kid, we are always uh, we are always being told, Are you are still a kid, you don't know Tumne Dunya nahi dekhi hai, to put it in Hindi. Uh, you have not seen the world and you so uh, my so how what what are the different ways that you address this and also to answer the question that uh, uh, Fernanda has asked you. Yeah. So it's like what I would say it's like uh, basically with those kids in particular who don't like who do think that uh, climate change is not real. It's just like try to show them reality, not in a way like that you learned it. Because for me, how I learned about things was just basically reading out articles, listening to what my parents said or what the experts said. But it's like for them, they doesn't really believe that it's real. So for me, instead, it's like if I am a person who is like, Okay, I believe that floods are a natural phenomena and it's like we can't really add up to it. But we know it's like, yes, it's a natural phenomena, but somewhere our uh, like bad actions are giving it a boost. We all know that. But it's like, uh, for me, instant, I am a person who is like, it's a natural phenomena. We can't do anything to even like reduce its uh, sort of like effect that it has on us. So what would you do like for me to make me understand about it? You could just uh, probably give me an example of like, okay, so this was a flood which happened this time earlier. And uh, this is a flood which happened now. And you see the difference that this is what like is a drastic difference. And to be honest, it's like try like showing them as like a really simple thing. Like because it's like we know like cutting out trees can really like uh, is going to be like really severe when it comes to like floods because somewhere like the roots, they tend to hold the soil, but now they're not holding it, so it's gonna wash up, like like the whole thing is gonna wash up. So we can very easily show it like, uh, with sort of like small things, because it's like for me even, uh, what I try to, how I try to make people aware is sort of like, uh, try to show them the reality in a small, like, because like as we learn science, no, uh, like uh, our teacher used to do the experiment or show us the video, and it would be like, okay, this is what happened. So this is how it's like, it's it's not a natural phenomena. This is what's been happening. And you should be taking action because this is how it is affecting you. And it's like, it could be as uh, like, if you want anyone to take action, it could be just like, okay, this flint happened in my place. And the very next day, no one knows like when it, it's going to flood. It could be just like the next day that it could flood here. So no one really knows what's going to happen next. So it could just be like, okay, this flood happened in Kerala today and it could just happen your place the next day so you have to be the one uh, keeping in mind and trying your best to just to at least like reduce the thing because you can't really stop flooding so this could be like your whole phenomena and try to make them uh, kind of like grasp the concept in like as fun way as you can because it's like for me even I try to make I try to crack out jokes even like when I'm trying to make like anyone uh, like kind of like understand what it is because it's like joke is gonna make you laugh but at the same time it's really gonna make you somewhere feel like yes this is a joke but yes it's it's, it's reality you know so it's like trying to make them understand in a funner way and trying uh, telling them the pr practicality and showing them the thing could really work out because that's what like it worked out uh, like with me as well and to answer your question next one it, it was like it's, it's a really terrible to be honest in the very beginning being uh, like a small kid and being an activist because you know at the age of nine you trying to like uh, take a concept which like not many people were talking about at that time and even like there were not many activists out there Greta was not there like activists like known activists were not there and in India specifically not many people it's like very few people were working and I really didn't know knew like about them 
so i was i just like felt really very alone and i was like am i doing this right am i doing this is, is it wrong is it right and i was really confused i was a uh, kind of like lost child in my own world and to be honest it's like when you are a person trying to just like convey a thing and in response when you get kind of like sort of hate from people or when you get a uh, sort of like a uh, kind of like a uh, the sort of people telling you that this is not a proper thing for you you shouldn't be working on this area you should be concentrating on your studies at that date you kind of get a uh, sort of like a uh, cheer them very quickly because i was like when people used to say me like okay, okay you should study it, it's not a real thing it's just like someone has brainwashed you or something at that time i would be like is it wrong is it right i used to get really confused out that was really really very bad and at the same time it's like being a new activist trying to bring a change and like uh, going out and making kids aware because i personally try to ma- uh, like make uh, young kids aware and for that i do used to like travel to their schools and colleges because somewhere i feel just like uh, shooting the school and be like okay i can't come because i have my school and stuff it can't really bring up a change because until and unless i go to them i talk to them personally i ask them questions they ask me questions until and unless we have that interaction we can't really bring up a change so i feel like uh, interaction is really important so i go to schools like in different parts of india even out of india i do attend conferences out of india it's like so because of all this i somewhere kind of like i have to skip my school it's like after that uh, it's like grasping on the concepts afterwards completing out your work even it's kind of a really hard thing but the most hard thing is like uh, uh, like facing out hate and people saying what you're doing is not right and uh, like you are faking it out you are just doing it for fame and i hope like i guess somewhere sir you have also felt uh, like might have faced this thing because this is the most uh, like thing which people do say you are doing it for fame but we are not really so this is what's been happening but yeah to be honest th- this was a thing which was really bothering me in the very beginning but now to be honest it doesn't really bother me and to be honest it's like the hater comments that i get now the like these days i just laugh on them because it's like i do feel that they are kind of useless and they try just like those people it's like what i feel is like they don't have any work so they are just like a kind of person who doesn't really know the things are those who doesn't really have anything they're just sitting out uh, like uh, on their phones and commenting bad because they don't really even it's like if, if you don't really want to try at least don't make people kind of like get disheartened so this is what i feel about them And yeah, it's pretty much it's like it's kind of like thing which I'm not really bothered about to be honest right now. Thank you, thank you, Ridhima, for that uh, uh, frank and honest opinion and the uh, uh, points you made about uh, what it is it like to be a young climate activist, a young environmental activist. Uh, we have two more questions, and I think these will I will. Uh, keep them as the last two questions in the interest of time because we are slightly over time my apologies to the panelists and the participants uh, but i will take these last two questions uh, since children the first question is since children are more vulnerable to environmental hazards can any one of the panelists tell us which country or region in the world where children are highly affected uh, and the second question is uh, a practical question which kind of changes can a youth organization make in their organization to help making a more healthy environment for youth workers and youngsters some examples no water games in summer camp the food we give etc so these are the two questions uh, uh, anyone feel free to take it up i'm happy to help on the first and maybe um sahel or redima for the second so um yes uh, there are certainly there's a large disparity between regions and and countries in terms of um both the inv- the sort of impacts that are being experienced of course but also um you know factors such as poverty and so on which which disproportionately affect children as it is and then of course make them even more vulnerable to environmental impacts so um i'm going to post in the in the chat some a couple of unicef reports so unicef does a huge global job of collecting data on many issues of practically every issue that affects children 
um, and, are, and are increasingly collecting data around environmental impacts. So there's one uh, very uh, good report from 2016 on air pollution and one on climate change from 2015 um, that shows that huge impacts in Asia, across Asia, there's a huge problem both in terms of toxic air and, and climate impacts and Africa as well. But um, I would encourage you to look at the reports. They're really interesting and have more in-depth um, information. I'll post them. Thank you, Joni. Uh, Seher, Radima, would you like to take the second question on uh, what kind of changes young youth organization can make to help making a more healthy environment for youth workers and youngsters? Any, yeah. Yeah, any answers from your experience? Yeah, all right, sure. Thanks, thanks for the question. It's actually a very interesting question. And um, it's actually very much related to what greenwashing is. So you, whenever you're joining a youth organization, uh, you're very passionate about you know, helping Mother Nature, you're very passionate about solving the environmental crisis, all great things. But uh, if you're joining an organization, just make sure that they're not greenwashing. Uh, just do some research, some background research, and you will find out if they're actually greenwashing, if they're actually just like the governments and global politicians, they're just, you know, feeding in your brain that they're doing the talking and solving the climate crisis. This is not how it works. As far as the events are concerned, like organizing the summer camps where you uh, get more close to the na nature um, or organizing any other things that you mentioned in the, in the question, um, I believe that if you are a participant um, at a very personal level, so if I'm a participant at a such event, I will uh, I will protest on the spot if there is in, in any case calling us in a sustainable in the name of sustainability in the name of climate action and they are just uh, disobeying climate action in all ways like uh, they are wasting or they are you know um, having. I don't know, having a lot of energy consumption in a way, I or whatever you know better in your context. But I believe that uh, first, the first step should be to leave that organization, which it have been greenwashing you. If you think that you're being greenwashed, uh, then just leave that organization. Uh, I think that you, in order to do this, you really have to make yourself more climate uh, aware, more climate literate in a way that you know what greenwashing is. Because greenwashing can happen under the, under the lines and you won't probably even realize what happened to you, right? So I believe that this this should be the first step. And this is how the or, uh, what the young organization, what the youth-led organization or like climate-friendly organizations can do is that they, uh, they have more young people's voices who actually are active and who actually know what, what um, climate-friendly thing is, right, to do. And they, then they have the, this thing. And if they don't, then just pr pr protest on this uh, on the spot. It's your basic right. If you if you stand, if you really believe on climate change, if you really feel that it's affecting you because it is, then just protest on the spot. No, no, no more waiting. We have been waiting since several thousand years. You don't have to wait now. Just protest on the spot. Well, thank you, Seher. Uh, I think with that, we could uh, uh, bring our Q&A session to an end. Uh, before we conclude, I would invite uh, all of you uh, panelists to give any short messages, to make any short messages uh, for our participants before we bring this wonderful discussion to a close. And uh, yes, I, I leave it up to three of you to uh, begin. Who wants to go first? I uh, will go on. Uh, so it's like, uh, to be honest, uh, it's like everyone has just said what should be done and stuff. So I won't dig into that again. I would just say it's like uh, we have to realize that as being the youth, as being the one being the most impacted, but still doesn't having that contribute towards climate change. We should raise our voices against like the discrimination that's been happening like with us because it's like to be honest uh our older generation had a healthy childhood but we are not having that so it's like to be honest we should also get a healthy childhood and for that 
like no one is going to work for yourself you have to like work for yourself and it's like to be honest this is a selfish world and everyone is just thinking about themselves so make sure that you are coming up you are coming like on board try to protect yourself in your rights and uh, like try not to being selfish because it's like uh, it's somewhere it's like we have seen how it's like our selfish government somewhere it's like uh, kind of like destroying each and everything out every resources and what they are leaving to us is just like destruction and is just suffering so i don't want personally i don't want to pass on suffering to the coming generation so let's uh, like to be honest we should be trying to do things not only just thinking about ourselves but also about like the other species and the coming generations and yeah it's just like uh, trying your best and taking action is one of the most important key uh, to bring up action and somewhere i am the one being an optimistic person till now that yes we can change the things up and i would request you all just to like made my make my feelings true that yes uh, things things can change up and yeah i really hope that we could really see positive change ahead thank you ravi ma yeah i would just say that, well thank you first of all for inviting me and i i guess the thing to say is um although it's a huge problem i think there's also signs of hope right i mean the incredible movement that that children and young people are leading the responsibility should not be on their shoulders but still it gives me hope and also makes me even more determined every day to fight for this right and i think now we're seeing real signs of of movement and progress um and uh, certainly from from my perspective I'm absolutely committed to to doing everything in my power through my networks and through seri and um you know remembering that our, there are so many people like us out there that do want this and we're not alone it's just that there are powerful voices but we need to make ourselves heard thank you yes so yeah uh, thank you so much uh, for organizing this and thank you so much for invi- inviting us it was my true pleasure to be here with the two great panelists and thank you so much maxin for moderating everything so so finely uh, what i want to leave this uh, conversation at is that um, we know that uh, pe- the adults can discourage you the the society where you live in can pass on discouraging comments uh it can be very depressing sometimes and i do understand that depression due to climate crisis is a real thing uh but i just want to say one thing here that uh one of the most uh favorite physicist of mine said uh stephen hawkins and he said that wherever there is light there is hope hope only disappears when you believe that something is hope it something is like yeah something has ended or something but i believe that this is not the end you can still make it better maybe not for yourself but for your future generations so whenever somebody is asking you like uh and i'm i quote in my own language beta nokri milegi ye sab karke so just don't pay attention to that uh, go ahead do it believe on yourself believe that you're changing every day you're standing for the world for every single person not only in the present but also in the future you're standing up for the future generations and you're standing up for your own self i think that this is the best best like the best satisfaction that you can have and no matter wh- where you speak from your voice counts no matter what you do your act counts and no matter how small it is it counts every single thing every single thing counts like if we if we didn't believe on our actions then the climate strikes would not have started the young people had not started the climate strikes and we would still be on page 1 paris agreement might have never happened if we just believed on words and ne- nothing so uh, yeah today like this this month happened the 5th year anniversary of paris agreement so just you know try to give life to those words and i push your governments to give life to those words and turn those words into action and you can do it no matter how small of a thing you do you can do it no matter where you are based who who you are whom like what place you're from 
uh, what country you're from, like what religion you're from, you can do it because it's affecting you. It's affecting the vulnerable and marginalized community in your country. So believe in yourself. This is the first step. You are a climate leader. You are an agent of change. Even if I don't know your name, you can do it. And you just have to believe in yourself. Thank you, Joni, Ratima, and Sahir for those wonderful, inspiring messages uh, filled with hope, filled with a call to action. And I hope uh, our participants will take forward these messages about the importance of this uh, very crucial issue that we discussed here over the last hour on how important is it to have a healthy environment for a safe and sustainable uh, planet. Uh, not just for us humans, but sometimes also, uh, not just for humans, but also for uh, all living creatures. The entire uh, planet is interconnected. So it was wonderful to uh, have this discussion with you uh, on this, uh, on the right to a healthy environment, on this important occasion of uh, uh, human International Human Rights Day. And uh, I hope that as we move from the last month into a new year, that we move into a, a, a year filled with action. It was supposed to be a decade of action. And I think it was a wonderful, it was a, as terrible as it was, it was a signal from mother nature for us to pull up our socks and get to work as fast as we can in this decade of action. Uh, I invite all the participants to uh, have a look at the links that Joni has shared us to have a look at Yango have a look at uh, Radhima's work, get in touch with them, uh, connect with them either on social media uh, to see how you guys could collaborate or uh, help support them in the wonderful work that they are doing. Uh, you could also visit www.donboscogreen.org for more information about the Don Bosco Green Alliance uh, and how we are uh, creating a platform, a network for young people to work together on important environmental issues. Uh, before we end, I would like to quickly take a screenshot, uh, a group picture, so that we could have this uh, wonderful day in our record, in our memory. So uh, if you could, uh, if whoever uh, would like to quickly, uh, you know, uh, put on their cameras so that we could take a group picture and feel free to do so. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, here we go. I think I can do that. All right. One, two, three. Let me get a couple more for posterity. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone Wonderful. Everyone for coming here. And uh, have a good evening, good day, good afternoon, wherever you have logged in from. Thank you. And thank you, dear panelists. Thank you, Joni, Sahir, Ridima, for coming here. It was wonderful to have you guys on this discussion. And uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you yeah. very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.